Hello, everyone. I'm Charlotte. And I'm Dina. Welcome to The Grim Curriculum. So this is finally it. Episode 50. How are we feeling about this? I feel like our fifth episode was seriously just yesterday. Mm -hmm. Like We covered the Black Dahlia, and at the end we were talking about how excited we were that we released five whole episodes. So 50 kind of just seems unreal to me. I'm, I'm really, really proud of our little library that we've accumulated, though. Yeah, me too. It's been a really awesome year working on this with you, and everyone's been so wonderful in their support. I'm really proud of us, and I'm honestly just looking forward to seeing what the future has to bring us. Aw, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Now, as most of you already know, we've been keeping this topic a big secret, and it's because it's honestly the most gigantic topic we have ever covered, literally and figuratively. Definitely. We have uh, never covered an event with this many casualties before. And I don't think we've ever covered something that most of us would consider a household name. Right? So, uh, no pressure. <laughs> now nah, we got this. Dear listeners, today we are starting our series on the tragedy of the Titanic. That's right. Over the course of the next few weeks, we will be exploring everything from the building of the ship to the state of it now and everything in between. We aren't kidding. We've been working on this one for quite a while and there's so much to go over. And trust us, this one has it all. Tales of courage and survival, not to mention stories of betrayal and heartache, all with some unsolved mysteries and a few conspiracy theories mixed in at the end. And of course, in true grim fashion, we are going to set out to teach you something that you may not have known about this tragic ship. We're really excited for you all to join us on this harrowing adventure. All right, so to begin, in the late hours of April 14th, 1912, the RMS Titanic hit an iceberg while on her maiden voyage to New York. RMS stands for Royal Mail Steamer or Royal Mail Ship. Three hours later, the ship would sink. 2,240 people were on board. Over 1,500 lost their lives. The 705 survivors waited for hours in the freezing cold until rescue arrived. The wreck of the Titanic would not be discovered until 1985, where it sits 3,810 meters underwater to this day just off the coast of Newfoundland. It is now at risk of fully deteriorating by 2030, and researchers are currently scrambling to explore as much of the ship as possible before the ocean finally claims it for good. You may know this story from the 1997 hit movie Titanic, starring Kate Winslet and Leonardo DiCaprio. It's also inspired more books, movies, and just overall creative works than we can count. But we're here to bring you the true story, or at least as much of it as we can. Oh my god, I can't even begin to explain how happy I am to be doing this. <laughs> I approached you about this as a potential series a few months ago, and I was honestly so happy when you were as on board as I was. Yeah, of course. Oh my god. I <laughs> have had a almost unhealthy fascination with the Titanic <laughs> like since I was a child, and I don't even think fascination is strong enough of a word. It was an obsession when I was younger. I saw the movie, but I was interested in the actual ship. Because it was probably the first time I'd heard about a tragedy like this, and I still don't know why, but I felt what I can only describe as, like, a strong emotional pull towards it. Mm -hmm. I would go to the library and get all the books on it that I could. Like, I was, like, eight years old. I memorized <laughs> all the facts I could about it. I was just completely oh. smitten. Like, I've shown you the little pictures of me, Charlotte. I I was also able to... Oh, yes. To, yep, yep. I'm, I might post those online. I don't know. They're pretty <laughs> embarrassing. <laughs> I was able to visit the Titanic exhibit here ages ago, and oh. it was unreal. Like, I love this story so much, you guys. And honestly, I think little eight-year-old me would be pretty stoked to see me, first of all, still talking about it, but people <laughs> actually, like, listening. Like, not to get too cheesy on you guys, but, like, this makes me really happy. No kidding. It's, it's a piece of history that honestly shook the entire world over a hundred years ago. 
And it still continues to fascinate people of all ages to this day and probably will for a very, very long time to come. My little sister has been obsessed with it like you since she was little. So I hope we do it justice. I'm sure we will. We got those. (laughs) The really wonderful thing about covering the Titanic for me is the sheer amount of information out there that's available. Mm -hmm. Because I honestly think, and you and I were talking about this the other day, like there's more out there about the Titanic than every other episode that we have ever covered. Like we could do a full like 30 episode series on this. 100%. And if you do want to know more beyond what we're going to be talking about on the podcast, then please, please make sure you check out our Patreon because we're going to be posting some extra content there, including some um, behind the scenes deep dive videos. Yeah, there's going to be a lot going up on there that we might not have time to share throughout the series. So yeah, check it out. All right. And with that, let's get started. Many of you may already be familiar with the name White Star Line and its reputation as one of the finest forms of passenger travel across the Atlantic. It originally started as a cargo hauler and it was founded in 1869 by Henry Ismay and by 1908 they had begun work on three separate ships, the Olympic, the Titanic, and the Gigantic, which they later renamed the Britannic. While their competitors, the Lusitania and the Mauritania, focused on speed, White Star Line wanted to provide an experience that people would legitimately enjoy, especially those who wanted to experience the finer things in life. They realized that they could not compete with the speed of their competitors, so they instead focused on the journey itself. That being said, the ships were still quite fast. The Titanic was set to complete its trip in about a week, which for the time was really impressive. The entire goal of these ships was to provide passengers with a more comfortable form of travel, something to look forward to and enjoy, rather than a quick trip that they just wanted to get over with. Not only that, they were set to be the largest ships of their time with a length of 882 feet. To me, the idea of something that massive being built now is impressive. Like, oh, yeah. I, I can't even begin to imagine how people felt about this as a man-made marvel at the time. Absolutely. Even when I see today's cruise ships, it always blows my mind just how massive they are. And then to make something as big as the Titanic with the tools of the time, absolutely mind boggling. It really is. The ship was set to be constructed in Belfast Island. Belfast shipbuilding company Harland and Wolf, which interestingly enough still operates to this day, undertook the majority of the design work when it came to the Titanic. Their team involved naval architect Thomas Andrews and deputy naval architect Edward Wilding. Andrews would take the job over from Alexander Carlyle, who would retire in 1910, but stayed involved in the project as a consultant. The man in charge of the whole thing was Lord Perry, the director of both Harland and Wolf and White Star Line. The two companies made an agreement that White Star Line would use Harland and Wolf to build all of their ships, and in return, Harland and Wolf would not work for any of their competitors. In 1908, the final plans for the Titanic were submitted after countless hours of work. Joseph Bruce Ismay, the son of Henry Ismay, approved the plans and construction was set to begin in late 1908 to early 1909. The total cost of the project was $7.5 million in 1912 money. And a quick little fun fact, when accounting for inflation, that is actually less than it took to make the 1997 movie Titanic. $1 million of the total cost went into building a thousand foot long double gantry that would hold the ships while they were being built. They named it the Errol Gantry. And this thing in itself was a pretty impressive sight to see. If you are ever lucky enough to find yourself at the Titanic Belfast, which is the attraction that now stands where the ships were built, you can see a replica of the Errol Gantry. It stands 66 feet high, which may seem impressive, but the original structure was over four times that. I'm going to shamelessly nerd out over the entirety of this series, (laughs) so don't mind me. No, that is fine. But can we talk about how amazing it is that not only the ship was impressive, but building the thing that was going to hold it in itself was considered a huge feat. It took a total of 26 months for the Titanic to be built. 
They began with the keel or the bottom of the ship and then built around it. At a length of 269 meters, it was the largest man-made moving object in the world. And it certainly gained international attention. Charles Lightoller, the second officer on board of the Titanic, was quoted as saying, You could actually walk miles along the decks and passages covering different ground all the time. I was thoroughly familiar with pretty well every type of ship afloat, but it took me 14 days before I could, with confidence, find my way from one part of the ship to the other. On May 31st, 1911, more than 100,000 people attended the launching of the hull into the River Lagan. The majority of the people that came out to watch actually purchased tickets for this event. It was a huge deal and many had traveled from all over to see the impressive feat for themselves. The entire process of getting the ship into the river could not have gone better. At this point, expectations were high and White Star Line was set to meet them. Once the ship was in the river, work began on the decks, interiors, and the 29 boilers that would power the ship's engines. This project provided a lot of work for people of all types of professions, including everything from steel workers to skilled craftsmen. This was especially evident for the first class cabins. All evidence of functionality was hidden by fine art and fancy furniture so as to not take away from the luxury. Everything was handcrafted by the best of the best. Each room also boasted fine art. The goal was to take the breath away of even those with the highest expectations. And of course, there was the grand staircase. I think this is one of those things that everyone just knows about. Mm -hmm. If you've seen the 1997 movie, you'll know all about it. A lot of work went into making it look as accurate as possible. The banisters were made from the best Irish oak that money could buy, and they were encased in wrought iron grills. They were then decorated in the style of Louis XIV. The Titanic had earned itself the reputation of being practically unsinkable very early on in this process. Shipbuilder magazine published a special issue dedicated to the three Olympic liners. They talked about a state-of-the-art design that many now believe may have doomed the ship from the start. They built a double bottom with 15 watertight bulkhead compartments each one with electric watertight doors that could be opened or closed individually by switches on the bridge. This was a huge deal. They said that this would allow for parts of the ship to be sealed off in case of an emergency and not allow water to get into the other compartments. The ship would be able to stay afloat if up to four of its compartments filled with water. Unfortunately, they did not account for any more than that, which is what would ultimately lead to complete disaster. Another flaw that many of you have probably heard about was the lack of lifeboats. The Titanic only had enough lifeboats to hold 1,178 people. When you accounted for the crew, there would be potentially over 3,300 people on board. And you're probably wondering how they got away with that. Well, they actually had more than the amount they needed, according to the British Board of Trade, which does that not just... (laughs) I feel like that rings true somehow. Yep, they were completely fine with the ship only being able to accommodate one third of its passengers in the event of a sinking. That wasn't to say that everyone agreed with that. In a conversation, Bruce Ismay said the following to Thomas Andrews. Control your Irish passions, Thomas. Your uncle here tells me you proposed 64 lifeboats and he had to pull your arm to get you down to 32. Now, I will remind you, just as I reminded him, these are my ships. And according to our contract, I have final say on the design. I'll not have so many little boats, as you call them, cluttering up my decks and putting fear into my passengers. He was happy to sacrifice safety for aesthetic. (laughs) I, as a passenger, would feel better being like, oh, hey, there's lots of lifeboats, rather than being like, oh, hey, there's a suspiciously small amount of lifeboats. Right? I just, it's so incredibly irresponsible. And I guess it just goes to show, like, man's hubris when it comes to, um, I don't know, Girl bossing a little too close to the sun, I guess. Yep. Oh my god. 
The Titanic also had the four large funnels that gave it an even more majestic appearance. Only three were fully functional, while the fourth was used for ventilation only, and of course, for aesthetic. I found a bunch of the original plans and blueprints online, and they are absolutely amazing. Like, I want to frame them and put them up on my walls. Like, they're gorgeous. If you could get prints made, do it. Oh my god, absolutely. I'll make sure those get shared with everyone because, like, you guys have to see them. It's something I could look at for hours and still find something new and interesting to look at. Oh, definitely. Soon enough, tickets were available for sale and people of all walks of life scramble to get their own spot on the luxurious liner. One of the things that White Star Line really set out to do with the Titanic was to provide a -a one-of-a-kind experience regardless of the class of ticket that you were able to purchase. Because of that, even third-class accommodations boasted more than the average person was used to. That meant that third-class tickets were by no means cheap. They accounted for around 7% of the average skilled laborer's yearly salary at a whopping cost of $35 in 1912 money, which still amounts to around $1,000 today. And that's in US dollars. Yeah, not cheap. And for that, I mean, they did get a pretty comfortable travel experience. They lived on the lower decks or steerage, and they slept in four to six person cabins. Some were filled with passengers of the same sex, while others were occupied by full families. Men and women who were unmarried or traveling alone were separated at either end of the ship. Now, apparently, they had a lot of toilets available, but only two baths, one for the men and one for the women. Which is pretty concerning, considering that 710 of the passengers on board carried a third-class ticket. Oh, rough, man. Mm Mm-hmm. Food was also provided for them, which, when compared to other ships, was not the norm. They were given fairly basic meals, and passengers were treated to freshly baked bread and an assortment of fruit on a daily basis. The passengers shared two communal areas for eating, as well as an outdoor deck and various rooms for entertainment. All in all, while their accommodations may seem quite simple compared to the other classes, the Titanic succeeded in offering a much more enjoyable travel experience than any of its competitors. Those traveling second class didn't quite get the first class experience, but they were still given a lot of very comfortable amenities. 285 people on board the Titanic held a second class ticket, which they paid around $65 for. For this, guests would get their own private cabins with shared bathrooms and hopefully more baths than third class. They also had access to various forms of entertainment, such as a very impressive library and the large decks where they could sit and enjoy some fresh air. They could reserve their own wooden chair on the deck for the entirety of the trip for one dollar. Male passengers were allowed to visit the smoking rooms where they'd spend the majority of their time chatting and relaxing. What it seems to look like is the men kind of stayed in the smoking area while the ladies would spend their time enjoying the sun or the library. I would much rather have that experience than a stinky old smoke room anyway, just saying. I completely 100% agree with you there. With a bunch of unbathed men. Yeah, yeah. Oh, (laughs) Lord have mercy. What a long week that would have been. (laughs) Second class amenities on the Titanic were similar to what the other ships provided for first class ticket carriers. So these guests were quite well looked after. Rather than take the stairs, they were treated to elevators to get them up and down the decks. The majority of the people who carried a second-class ticket were journalists, tourists, and academics. It appealed to them that they could enjoy the type of things that most other ships would charge first-class pricing for. Honestly, despite where you stayed on the ship, you were promised a better experience than anyone else could offer. Before the ship set sail, they were allowed to tour the first-class areas. And speaking of first class, this is my favorite part. Honestly, like this entire area was just pure art. Oh, it, bougie to the utmost Ugh, degree. Yes. <laughs> Every single inch of the first class area was made to be as luxurious and as beautiful as possible. The amount of work and artistry that went into this is absolutely unreal. 
We've all seen the pictures. Everything was hand chosen from the chairs to the art on the walls to make things feel as high class as humanly possible. And for good reason, those tickets weren't cheap. First class tickets were priced at around $400 each, with the most expensive coming in at a whopping $3,300 in 1912 money. That particular ticket bought you two bedrooms, wardrobe rooms, a sitting room, and a private 50-foot promenade. We'll be showing pictures throughout the episode on YouTube, and if you aren't listening there, we highly suggest you check it out. It really is just a stunning space. This room would be occupied by Charlotte Drake Cardeza, her maid Annie Ward, valet Gustave Lazure, and her 36-year-old son, They were returning from a hunting trip in Africa and were looking forward to enjoying the most lavish experience money could buy on the Titanic. They would all survive and collect a large sum of insurance money for their lost goods. First class ticket holders came from all walks of finer living. Some were famous celebrities of their time. Others were high-ranking officials and dignitaries, as well as founders and heirs of companies that still exist to this day. Like Macy's. Isidore Strauss, the owner of the company, and his wife Ida were among those on board who did not survive. The staff of those with first-class tickets generally did not get to enjoy the amenities themselves, as the majority of them actually carried a second-class ticket. Benjamin Guggenheim, his mistress, and uh, you guys, I'm going to do my best on these names. (laughs) Uh, The famous French singer Leontine Aubert. Valet Victor Gigilio and driver Rene Pernot were also among those who perished in the sinking. Leontine Aubert's personal maid, a woman named Emma Sagasur, survived and lived until 1964. And yes, among them all was the now famous, unsinkable Molly Brown, but we are going to save her story for another episode. And if you recognize that name but aren't quite sure who she was, Kathy Bates played her in the movie. And oddly enough, that is like the third time we've brought up Kathy Bates in this podcast. I know. And I was just going to say, we fucking love Kathy Bates we around do. here. <laughs> there were four other parlor suites on B deck with two bedrooms each, two wardrobe rooms, as well as a private bathroom. One of the things that made these rooms even more impressive was that they had a number of electric appliances, such as phones and heaters. I thought this was really interesting because, again, this is 1912. Mm -hmm. Like, it's so impressive to me that they had access to these things while traveling. But it really just amazes me how different this experience would have been for pretty well everybody else on board. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, some people on the ship may never have been in a place with electricity at that point in time still. Definitely, yeah. They also had access to two private interior promenades that were decorated in a Tudor design. These offered an exclusive view on either side of the ship and measured 50 feet in length. These rooms were occupied by Bruce Ismay along with Thomas Andrews, who we're going to talk about a lot more later, as well as the Baxter family from Montreal. The Baxters consisted of the widow Baxter and her two children, Mary Helene and Quig. Unfortunately, Quig Baxter would not survive. That's such an unusual name. That's not like a survival name. No, I don't I, think I picture so like a frail little, this, this is my son Quig, and he's like all little, and he's like, mommy, I'm small. It's entirely possible that he was small and frail. I mean, it was 1912, so still, um, I believe, no, uh, Victorian times. Actually, hold on. Let's pull up a picture of Quig Baxter. Okay. Because I looked at him. Oh, actually, he looked like quite the little athlete. Okay, well then, Quig Baxter, we're sorry to ba- about bashing he, you like no, that. No, he's like, he's on like a, a rowboat, he's got an oar in his hand, like, he was... Okay, well, yeah, we well, will not have any more Quig slander in this no, episode. No, not in this house. <laughs> oh, poor Quig. And again, we're going to share as many photos as we can, including one of Quig, uh, but we're going <laughs> to be posting a bunch of this on Patreon, because there's so much, and it's all really just worth seeing. That all being said, the rest of the first-class passengers certainly were promised an unforgettable experience. 
Unlike the second and third class rooms, most of the first class cabins were furnished in different styles, including that of Queen Anne and Louis XV. If you had one of the less expensive first class tickets, you stayed in a smaller cabin with a single bed and sink. These actually didn't even have their own bathrooms. Amenities such as fully functional gyms with rowing machines and other state-of-the-art equipment were available for those who wanted to stay active during their trip. For those more competitive guests, squash courts were also available. All this absolute luxury just made me think of something, and this is going to sound so silly, but it's basically like if you were playing The Sims and you just use the rosebud sheet to give yourself all the money and was like, you know what? My house is going to have everything on the catalog. <laughs> oh, that was like the best way to play The Sims. Yeah. And it's to me, this is what happens when someone does that, but it's a ship basically. Right. And they just have all this money and they're like, I want six of everything in there. Like they probably yeah. would have put like a full zoo on board if they could have. Oh yeah. Turn it into Noah's Ark. <laughs> yes. They also had access to Turkish baths, which were considered the height of luxury during that time. These baths cost a dollar a day and included a steam room, a cool room, a hot room, and a temperate room. They also boasted that they had a brand new invention, the electric bed. These were designed to heat the body using lamps. Man, my lizard heart would appreciate that very much. Right, it sounds comfy. (laughs) It does. Alongside the luxurious Turkish baths, you could find the first-class swimming pool. This particular pool was 30 feet long and 14 feet wide and was filled with seawater that was pumped from the ocean and then heated. Both men and women were allowed to enjoy this area. Women from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. and men from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. As for their meals, they had quite a few choices. They could eat in the main dining room or pay a little extra to eat at an a la carte restaurant. This room was a 100-foot-long saloon on D-deck. If you look at a picture of the ship, it would have been right around the second and third funnels. They chose this area because it would be the quietest and the most comfortable. The windows were leaded to further muffle any sound made from the ship itself. Unlike the other classes, they were given a large menu of food to choose from, as well as an assortment of fine wines and desserts. This area would be open from 7 p.m. to 8.15 p.m. every night. And if all that wasn't enough, they could pay even more to eat at a little place they nicknamed The Ritz. Operated by famous restaurateur Luigi Gatti, the Ritz promised a -a one-of-a-kind dining experience. The Ritz was an absolutely stunning space. The walls were made from the best French walnut, and fine art was displayed all around the room. Rather than the large tables that could be found elsewhere, guests were treated to a much more intimate dining experience. Small tables were lit by crystal lamps, and the restaurant stayed open until 11 p.m., Gaddy was actually specifically chosen for this role and was poached from a very successful restaurant in London to operate the space. As for during the day, they had a number of cafes that they could visit, including the famous Café Parisien, which offered a -a one-of-a-kind experience where you could sit and enjoy your food in comfort with a beautiful view of the ocean. The night the Titanic sank, the menu included oysters and pâté de foie gras with chocolate eclairs for dessert. As for the first-class smoking area, it was just as lavish as everything else. Women, of course, were not permitted into this area, and men would chat, play card games, and drink fine scotch together. Similar to their second-class counterparts, women would spend the majority of their time in the reading rooms where they would chat amongst each other, read books, and write letters to their loved ones. They also had elevators available to them so that they didn't have to bother with taking the stairs. However, the difference between these and the second-class ones is that they were outfitted with beautiful couches and art to make for an even more comfortable experience. It was clear that the passengers on the Titanic were promised a truly wonderful travel experience, regardless of class. Great effort went into making sure that each and every person on the ship would be happy that they chose White Star Line. However, sometimes when we spend all of this time talking about nice and happy things, we forget why we're here. Because at the end of the day, of the 329 first-class passengers, 130 would not survive. 
166 of the 285 second-class passengers would also perish, along with a whopping 536 men, women, and children in third class. And those numbers don't include the 685 crew members who would also die. But at this point, no one could have known that, and the ship was set to embark on its first and final voyage. And another interesting little side note here for you guys, it's reported that before the Titanic set sail, 20 different people had nightmares about it sinking and cancelled their trip, therefore likely saving their own lives. I am a big believer in listening to your dreams and your overall subconscious, and this made me think of all the people who cancelled their flights on September 11th or didn't go into work that day just because something felt off. No kidding. Something else that's interesting to note is that financier J.P. Morgan, whose shipping line controlled White Star Line, cancelled his trip on the Titanic at the last minute due to business matters that had come up. We always do our best to have as much information about the victims involved in any tragedy, and this story is no different. There's full archives that contain as much information as available about every single person that was on board the ship. We'll be focusing on the stories of tragedy and survival later in the series. And truthfully, like we said earlier, there are so many, we could literally do countless episodes about it. And I mean, I gladly would. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's why we're going to be sharing so much more information on Patreon and also why this series is going to be so long. But not in a bad way. I'm so stoked to talk about everything. And just, I'm I'm excited to bring all this information to you guys. Of course, oh. you guys know so much already because so many of you do. We always hope to bring you some new information. So I'm stoked for that. We're excited. Yes. So at the end of the day, the average person had no possible way of knowing things would end up the way they did, especially considering most people only focused on one part of the whole practically unsinkable thing. Yeah, they didn't say it was completely unsinkable, just practically. Well, not officially. One White Star Line employee was quoted as saying, Not even God himself could sink this ship. Uh, hubris, I tell you, it'll get you every he freaking probably time. probably felt pretty silly afterwards. Oh, yeah, no kidding. Well, regardless of the sinking, the Titanic was a sight to behold when it departed for its maiden voyage on April 10th, 1912. Hundreds of people gathered around to watch it set sail from Southampton, England. But things did not start smoothly by any means. A coal fire was discovered in one of the bunkers. It was hosed down as much as possible and shoveled aside. Something important to point out is that the fire continued to burn. However, the situation was assessed by the captain and chief engineer, and they both agreed that there had not been any damage that could affect the overall integrity of the hull structure. Crew members were told to work on controlling the fire while the ship took off on its voyage. And this may seem like a small detail, but we're going to bring it up again in a few episodes from now because there are many who believe that this fire could have been exactly what started it all. So the theory is that the fire got out of control partway through the trip and that the ship was ordered to go at full speed, which made the impact with the iceberg much more destructive. And if that's not bad enough, when the Titanic left the Southampton dock, it almost collided with the SS New York when the ropes holding the smaller ship snapped and it came loose. Quick-thinking crew members aboard the Titanic used the water generated by its large propellers to push the ship away before the two made contact. So that's incredibly impressive in my eyes, but definitely some bad omens right off the bat from the very start. Once the ship arrived in Queenstown, it was too large to fit into the dock, so passengers and their belongings were ferried onto the ship using small boats. The day was a sunny and warm one. People were eager and excited to begin their journey. The ship set sail on April 11th, just after lunch. For four days, things were uneventful and the maiden voyage was being considered a huge success. They were due to arrive at their destination in just a few more days. As we all know, that's not what would happen. At 11.40 p.m. on April 14, 1912, the Titanic would hit an iceberg and the uneventful trip would descend into total chaos. 
And that's where we'll be picking up things next week when we cover the sinking of the Titanic. Oh my <laughs> god. Cliffhanger. <sighs> <laughs> but not really. I'm sure you guys all know. Oh, I love this damn ship. I could talk about this all day. And in case you didn't pick up on it, I'm seriously just <laughs> so thrilled that we get to cover it on the podcast. Yes. Like we said, this is truly the biggest series we've done to date. And we honestly were just so excited to share it with all of you. I I know this is a much better topic than we normally cover. But like Charlotte said, I hope you all learned at least a thing or two this week. And uh, next week, things are going to get grim. Yeah, it's a fascinating story, but it's incredibly tragic. And it's like you, we mentioned before, it's one of those where we start reading and I'm like, oh, the luxury. It must have been so cool. Like I w- like would have wanted to be on this ship and see everything and experience mm-hmm. it. And then you're like, oh, right, it sinks. And it didn't end well at all. No. And it's funny that you say that because I kept looking through all the different photos of everything. And there were a few times where I was like, I wish I could have seen that in person. And I was like, no, 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 no. I don't want to have been there. That was bad. That's a ship you you pray sails away from you. Exactly. You know, knowing what we know now. Um, so a few things before we get going. First of all, thank you to everyone who has subscribed to our YouTube channel. We hit our goal of a, I was going to say a thousand, but we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. There. <laughs> <laughs> we hit our goal of 500 subs and we, I guys, we can, we can't express how much we appreciate that. Yeah. Can you believe we're doing this? It's, it's bonkers. Like it, it really is. Blows my mind. Uh, We also want to take a moment to let you all know about some fun things we have coming up on Patreon. You betcha. So our next movie night is right around the corner. And like we said, the behind the scenes videos this week are all going to be related to this series. But we're also going to post a bunch of extra info for everybody about the series. And you all know we can't talk about Patreon without thanking our grim VIPs and up. Yes, a huge, huge thank you to Brian, Mudkip, Hillary, Lisa, Pink Flamingo 20, and Johnny. The support on Patreon and Etsy really helps us, so thank you to everyone who's shown us love on there. Seriously, we can't say it enough. Uh, I think that's everything for the evening, isn't it? Yeah, that's about it. Okay, guys, well, uh, you know the drill. To keep up with the latest Grim Curriculum news, make sure you follow us on all the socials. We'll be linking our personal stuff down below, too. Thanks for listening. This has been The The Grim Grim Curriculum. Curriculum. Did you know some people can hear the sound of their eyeballs moving? It's called Superior Canal D... Sorry, I'm going to pronounce this correctly. Dehiscence, dehiscence syndrome. So basically, um, when they move their eyeballs in their sockets, it sounds like uh, someone scratching on sandpaper. Oh! And if that doesn't give you the heebie-jeebies, I don't know what will. Oh, you just heeb my jeebies so good. <laughs> Have a good night, everybody. Bye. Bye.